we're lucky to have uh, Benjamin Cabet, Principal Program Manager at Microsoft, and uh, he's going to present lessons learned from building a ThaniaML powered artificial nose. Benjamin, you're up. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks for, for joining. Uh, feel free to ask questions as they come, uh, and I hope I will uh, leave a few minutes at the end to, to take them. So I want to talk about the project I've been working on for the past few months. I started actually early uh, in the in the pandemic situation, and uh, this consists in uh, an artificial nose, like uh, Alessandro says. And uh, essentially, it's a device, and you can see it here, that can uh, that you can teach uh, and that can learn uh, smells, right? And you can uh, you can teach it to smell um, coffee, uh, whiskey, whatever, really. And uh, yeah, I want to talk about some of the lessons I learned along the way. Uh, full disclaimer: um, like I want to like state that upfront. I'm no data scientist, I'm no AI expert, or at least like I really wasn't um, as of last year. Uh, and yet I think it's uh, still an interesting uh, story to, to share with, with you all. Uh, a few words about myself in a nutshell. I'm, so I'm Benjamin, I'm a program manager at Azure IoT uh, at, at Microsoft. And uh, yeah, I do all things uh, open source community and you can find me on, on Twitter and other social media. Uh, and we'll, we'll get back to the IoT topic actually towards the, the end of the, um, of the talk. But yeah, in case you didn't figure by now, I'm French and I do like my bread, as in like my bread, like I'm trying to perfect, I've been trying to perfect my bread recipe for the past uh, couple decades. And um, I like early in the pandemic, back in May last year, I was actually um, like trying to perfect my bread recipe uh, as in like using and trying to use a, a, a sourdough starter and trying to figure out like when would be the perfect uh, time to bake the bread uh, based on um, like just the sourdough starter quality and, and smell in a sense. Uh, but also at the same time, uh, this was the situation uh, um, at the grocery store and at the supermarket, right? Hardly any flour on the shelves. And uh, this will have an importance uh, uh, for the, the rest of the, the story and, and, and the project, I guess. And so same like same time of the um, last year, I was also looking for an excuse, quite frankly, to um, to learn about AI, because this was a, a super abstract, super uh, complicated concept for me, even the simplest, uh, uh, let's train a, a, an AI model to recognize a single digit on a, like a bitmap kind of image. I, I, I couldn't get it, like it, it wasn't really tangible. And there was those um, uh, nice DIY kind of devices that the community was uh, putting together to kind of go in the directions that I wanted to. That is like trying to use um, sensors to um, to figure out the, the health, if you will, of, of a sourdough starter. Uh, but there was no AI, at least in, in, in that one. And what I really wanted to do is like use um, like try and find a DIY approach that would allow me to sort of I, or literally correlate the um, the smell of a sourdough starter with the quality of the bread that this particular sourdough starter would would yield, and hopefully over time build a model that could tell me, a hey, based on the on the smell and the uh, the health of a sourdough starter, tell me now is the perfect time to bake your bread, and so that's. That was a perfect excuse to learn about AI and TinyML, right? And so um, I, I don't need to remind you all what, what's TinyML, but in, in a nutshell, I started to, to see uh, an opportunity to finally have like a typical deep learning application, except that hopefully it would be slightly a slightly more tangible use case uh, where I could uh, potentially like finally learn what AI is and, and solve my, my actual problem. The only thing I would need was probably to be some kind of data set, right? Like capturing the scent, the smell of my sourdough starter, some kind of hardware, and not talking GPU, but more microcontroller kind of uh, hardware. A model uh, wasn't quite sure how to to best uh, like address that because like even the the um, single digit um, recognition problem was already too much for me. So we'll we'll, we'll get back to that one, and and some kind of framework, but I. I, I was familiar with TensorFlow Lite, and I, I, at least I, kn I knew where, where to start. But let's start with the data set. Data, data set wise, um, 
I quickly realized that my idea uh, is probably still a good idea, but it would, uh, especially back in May last year, it would have required me to bake dozens and dozens of baguettes, which I really couldn't uh, do based on the flour situation. So I sort of pivoted and I eventually realized that I, I could probably um, collect data, just like generic smells, right? And, and, and use that to put, hopefully train a model that would categorize and classify uh, smells. And my device being constrained, I would need to um, to move the data from the actual MCU, the super constrained device, to my training pipeline, my training environment, be it my desktop computer or a maybe a cloud environment, uh, and just like um, a um, just some name dropping here, but like I ended up using Edge Impulse, um, and there, I think there will be other talks later this week about Edge Impulse. But in a nutshell, it allowed me to sort of tether my constraint device to my uh, training pipeline uh, without having to um, like yeah to scratch my head and figure out how to uh, to to do that um, in embedded software essentially. And so um, I had sort of an, an idea of how I would collect my data set. And more specifically, this would be the hardware that I would be using. Uh, what's important uh, for this super short talk is just uh, to see what you have on the left hand side. Uh, just think of it as an Arduino, right? Except that it has a fancy LCD and uh, fancy interfaces that could be useful for um, an artificial nose eventually, but uh, in a nutshell, it's an Arduino. And on the right hand side, the gas sensor is off the shelf, super uh, affordable gas sensor that eventually, um, that effectively uh, can sense four categories of gases, uh, carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, volatile organic compounds, as well as ethyl alcohol. Um, it, it costs about 30 bucks to give you a sense of, of what it is. Um, also, as part of the lessons learned, I think it's worth mentioning that what really matters for the uh, that device that you saw earlier on the left-hand side is actually called a wheel terminal. But what really matters is the brains of it, if you will. The MCU, uh, so the MCU is effectively a Cortex M4F, um, and you have the specs here. Uh, it's actually plenty for for this use case. It leaves you plenty of room for your graphical user interface or for just sleeping right when when you're not doing anything else you can just say save energy um, um in terms of cost um a, a full-blown developer kit with your terminal developer kit um will cost you around 30 bucks which is depending on where you're coming from it's still fairly affordable but again what really matters is the brain uh within it and it's uh, just to give you an idea it's a, again a cortex m4 a microchip uh you can get it for five bucks Maybe not these days with the the, the silicon uh, shortage around the world, but it's pretty cheap. And again, it's it might actually be too much based on your use case. So if you, uh, it might be that you only require half the amount of RAM and, and memory, and in which case you can probably uh, um, cut the the price in in half, if not uh, more. So that's um, I think that's good figures to to have in mind. Uh, quickly because I think it's important to, to share that with you. How can a machine smell anyways? There's different uh, kind of sensors available out there, uh, but one of the, the most popular technique these days is using a metal oxide semiconductor, which um, in practice is a piece of metal that reacts with um, chemical compounds in the air. It's an oxidation reduction kind of um, uh, chemical reaction. And this causes the resistance of the metal to vary, which is something that you can measure uh, in your um, uh, microcontroller, right? It's going to give you an, an analog signal. If you have only 10 parts per million of, of VOCs in the air, it's going to be, say, 100 ohms. If you have a lot more um, um, gas, uh, a particular gas in the air, it's going to give you um, a, a different resistance, hence a different voltage when you measure that in your um, tiny MCU. So that means that you have data that you can feed into your, um, that becomes your training data set, right? I ended up collecting and realizing that only a few seconds of data uh, would be enough to capture the fingerprint, if you will, of a smell. And my intuition there was that um, I, well, I needed that, uh, not 
not too much, but not uh, too few, just to be able to capture things like what is the minimum, the maximum uh, uh, amount of uh, alcohol that I capture on, in this particular time window. There, There is an information in there, right? And that information might not be super visible here in the row um, uh, table. So you end up like needing to do some feature extraction, right? Which is something the edge impulse environment helped me do. But essentially, in my case, I realized that if I extract from my row sensor data, things like, and like we saw earlier in the ST workshop, things like the average, the minimum, the maximum, and some other statistical uh, characteristics for all my gases, that's all I need. Like that, th this this is meaningful information. This captures the the strength, the volatility of the smell. At least that's my intuition. I'm I'm no chemist, uh, on 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 no um, uh, like specialist in fragrances. But turns out this was enough to feed a good old like super simple fully connected neural network to just essentially build a, a model that could help um, and that would achieve uh, and establish a correlation between the characteristics of the smells and uh, the classes, right? In my case, it would be whiskey, coffee, ambient air, and whatnot. And that's essentially the model, like literally that's the model. Uh, you, you have only uh, that, that few hidden layers and, and this is really just the simplest architecture you could think of. Then you run that through TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers. I don't need to remind you uh, what it is, or or if I do, then you'll find other sessions later this week to, to learn more. But I, I, in a nutshell, for me, what was important is that it's available as an Arduino library, making it super easy to compose and to use the, um, uh, the neural network um, alongside the rest of my embedded software. Sharing uh, some useful figures again um, for the, the particular model you saw before. It, if you're only looking at classifying a handful of smells, you really don't need much in terms of uh, processing power and, and memory. It, the model fits in just four uh, kilobytes of RAM, uh, about the same in terms of like uh, flash and, 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 and code size. Uh, you need to add to that the, the, the code size of the TensorFlow Lite um, framework, but it's Still pretty small. Running the inference, you can do that in less than a millisecond on the uh, on the Wio terminal, which leaves you like I'm sampling my sensor data at 10 hertz. So if you do the math, it leaves you tons of time to either do your graphical user interface code or just again sleep, right, and save save energy that way. Uh, we've mentioned in previous talks ways to optimize the um, uh, the stuff even further if if needed. But um, yeah, that's. Uh, that's for the, the model. One thing that is important to have in mind, especially when it comes to tiny ML, you often do trade-offs between the, the performance and, and the, uh, the, the accuracy maybe of your model. A classifying network will always try to give you an answer, right? If I train my, if I give my model the characteristic of the, the smell of strawberry, it will probably classify that as maybe whiskey or, or honey will be classified as whiskey. So make sure to add somewhere in, in the mix um, a very simple anomaly detection uh, algorithm that allows you to flag data, input data that looks way too different from the data that you've used to train your mo model against. Because if like if the data is uh, nowhere near what the, the model has seen during the training phase, then it's likely that the results that you the model will give you are just random, right? So something to, to, to have in mind. And at this point, you're like, Benjamin, you've just been like, we are tiny ML AI data scientist experts. You've just been tinkering. You're telling us about a project that, that just uses a super basic neural network. What's the point? Well, that's the point. That's the point of the talk. Um, when I started building that project, I being a software engineer, I still had no clue uh, and was super scared about AI. And yet in a few hours, I, I achieved some interesting results. I ended up realizing that people were interested uh, to the point where I ended up like making it a full project, right? So the there's now like a, a full 3D enclosure that's open hardware and that you can go and, and download. There is um, like, I've been doing some, um, some noise about the, the project and although it's very much very much low tech at the end of the day like especially for you all like your, the neural network you've been laughing at it maybe and yet like it's been going viral as in folks has have been inspired and for some folks it like 
super purification AI. So well, I think that's yeah, one thing that I wanted to share with you is even if you work on super bleeding edge, hardcore, high tech stuff, make sure to, to like popularize as much as you can to take the tech that you're working on because many people although like they might be in, t in tech they might be software engineers they might not, like realize uh, the concrete applications because it's just too much math or uh, complex uh, scientific papers and so on so that's um yeah that's the project super happy to have been featured in in the make magazine and then the last step for me and before i i take questions questions was a hey, building an artificial nose, if this is going to be like an actually like industrialized kind of device, then uh, it might end up being deployed maybe in the, the ceiling of uh, buildings and like and restrooms to figure out when the, there is foul air and you need to send someone to do some cleaning. But if you're going to do that, it's not like you're going to send a technician look at the LCD display of the device. It needs to be connected, right? And the Wii terminal, the device that I used, turns out it has Wi-Fi. So what I ended up doing is what some people would call AIoT, take the artificial nose, the tiny ML powered artificial nose and connect it to an IoT platform. In my case, uh, that would have been the Microsoft Azure IoT platform to do things like sending the sensor data in real time so that I can like build a larger data set of smells for potentially improving my models over time or sending the the inference results, it smells 90% like foul air. It works the other way around, right? When you have an AIoT device, you also have this um, um, downlink that you can use to potentially make your device smarter and smarter over time by deploying new versions, uh, new versions of your AI model. And then, um, so that's the device effectively connected. Uh, it's like literally IoT plug and play. You can connect it to an IoT platform. You can maybe think of things like, hey, Alexa, how does it smell like in, in the restrooms right now? And uh, you, you could you could get the this answer. And along the, the same lines, it's what some people would call digital twins, right? That's sort of the next step. You build your tiny ML, super intelligent devices, and then you have your good old like IT environment. If you are in the real estate building management uh, business, you already have sort of like this graph of here are my buildings with all the, like the HVAC systems in them and blah, blah, blah. And that information you already have. And in those buildings, you may end up deploying physical devices, right? And in my case, this physical device might be the artificial nose. And the artificial nose, if it has a digital twin, a digital counterpart in the IT environment, then whenever this device says something, then you can react. You can you can navigate your graph, your digital twin's graph, and be like, oh, the artificial nose right now, it's in this particular um, restrooms uh, of this particular building, who's responsible for cleaning the, the building today? Oh, it's John. Let's text them, let's send them a, an, an SMS so that they go and do some 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 servicing, right? So that's that's the next step, I think, for, for TinyML, right? And, and and building connected environments. That's what I had. I'm probably over time by now. Find the project on GitHub. I'll drop the link in the chat as well. GitHub.com slash cardben slash artificial nose. And hopefully I have a few minutes for questions. Thank you. Benjamin, that was great. Uh, thank you for for the talk and for the great project. I mean, I've been following it from the start. So uh, great to see you learn to do tiny ML. It's uh, it's it's cool. Um, I'm still an imposter don't... though, but <laughs> we all are. <laughs> oh. Actually, yeah. how can we handle noise or sensor imperfections during inference? Uh, that's that's a really good one. Uh, so in my case, it turns out that the sensors are not too noisy, uh, but typically that sort of digital signal processing phase uh, where uh, I extract characteristics like uh, the average, the minimum, the maximum of the signal, that's essentially where uh, you can uh, sort of filter out the imperfections, right? The By definition, the average will remove some of the uh, outliers in, in the data set. And um, I, like for, for me, sampling 1.5 seconds of data at 10 hertz, so 15 samples, that's enough. There might be noise here and there, but uh, all in all, the um, the characteristics that are being extracted are um, are enough. Uh, Henrique has another question, and Alessandro, you will have to stop me if we need to wrap up, but that, I think that one is actually super interesting. Have you considered other hardware 
Um, yes, uh, the, what is really interesting with, uh, the, um, I think, this approach, and everything is open source, so you can also uh, trade for yourself, is um, if you care about, I don't know, detecting burning food, for example, you might realize that you need um, sensors that are better at picking up ammonia than the one sensor I used. And in, in which case, you may want to add that to the mix, right? Or you may want to add a simple temperature and humidity sensor just because, right? Because the like capturing, uh, just like our brain would, capturing um, this input uh, and feeding this input into the neural network might help you um, have better uh, results, or at least like depending on your use case, it might be a, a, an interesting one. And, and Alessandro, if if I can steal one minute, uh, it's it's a great uh, demo, Benjamin. Thank you. And it's actually it's an amazing viral story. I mean, we saw it like in the past few months. And so I think it, it shows like how much people are interested in this cool stuff, and also yes. how, how much you read the. Uh, I and to, yeah, and, and to everyone watching, like please again, it's open source, so please use it as a uh, just like I did as an excuse maybe to get yourself uh, started and 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 up to speed with all things tiny ML and TensorFlow Lite and so yeah. on. So, so my my question is uh, uh, for practical applications like some of this you mentioned, like in the bathroom and so on. What what is the bottleneck here, the tiny ML part or the sensor part? Because we know this kind of sensor there. They have some issues with sensitivity, selectivity, like, well, like for example, if you have too much humidity in the room, it may overwhelm the sensor and do this kind of thing. So, but kind of from your recent experience, what, what is a bottleneck really to have it like in, in volume and millions and deploy them everywhere? Is it the tiny wheel, the compute part, or, or the sensor part itself? From what I've seen, it's the sensor part. Uh, like, especially if you want to get in, um, like, my silly examples with coffee and whiskey, it doesn't get you really far. Like if you're in the perfume industry, you will like have like you will need way better accurate yeah. um, characterization of smells. Uh, or if you're in the food um, uh, f food industry, so I think the sensors exist, but exactly like you said, uh, they might not be uh, um, like they. They have some latency. They have some. Uh, they can be sensitive to to um, ambient conditions, etc. Um, but it's uh, still to be explored. And like it's like my project is the the fifty bucks version. Uh, I I doubt there can be as of today a fifty bucks version of a device that can like tell you oh this is this perfume from John Galliano or whoever. Uh, but but maybe actually I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I would like to acknowledge again uh, our sponsors. Uh, the sponsors are the ones that actually uh, made this, uh, made having a free registration for everybody possible, starting by Newton.ai, uh, who is innovating into the automa automated uh, tiny ML uh, domain, uh, who's also our, our um, uh, uh, premier sponsor. Next, we have the executive sponsors. Uh, we have ARM, which, as you know, builds from both the software and the hardware foundations for TinyML. Uh, we have Edge Impulse, who is uh, advocating strongly, as you all know, for uh, TinyML available to all of the developers. And of course, Qualcomm, uh, who is working as, you know, among other perception, reasoning and action and edge uh, and cloud devices in various sectors, such as uh, the Internet of Things, automotive, and mobile applications, uh, and Sintiant, who is moving artificial intelligence from the cloud to the edge, which as we have seen today, uh, it's quite now the trend nowadays. Uh, next, we have our Platinum sponsors, uh, Infineon, part of your life, part of tomorrow. We have seen a few of their projects uh, that they work today. We have Reality AI, uh, who is working also in pre-building uh, in pre-built edge AI sensing modules and tools. Uh, next, we have our gold sponsors. Latent AI is the first one who works on adaptive AI for the intelligent edge. Then we have SenseML, which works on building smart IoT sensor devices uh, from uh, uh, various data. And last but not least, our silver sponsors, uh, Emza from Israel, Greenwaves, uh, HOTC, Majimop, Quixo, Seed Studio, and of course, ST uh, Microelectronics. I would like to thank everybody that stuck around until now, and I hope to see everybody tomorrow at four o'clock Central European time.